Welcome. Welcome. I'm Frank Gavin, the director of the uh, Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, the International Security Speaker Series event, and this is the first in what we hope to be a uh, continuing and exciting partnership with the Re uh, Reinventing Diplomacy Initiative. And Mary, you're the first in this uh, sort of exciting collaboration. The inaugural. The inaugural, yes. Yeah, so uh, this is very, very exciting. Uh, I was thinking about what I would say here. There's a lot that I could say to introduce Mary. Mary is really one of the foremost scholars of the international history of our generation. She's an incredibly good friend. She's an amazing teacher. I could say all sorts of things. But I, I was rereading the book last night. In fact, we have a book club around here. And the first book we read, and it wasn't my idea, was to read your book. There's some people in the political science department. And I was thinking back to 1988, when I was graduating from the University of Chicago in international relations and thought I had some understanding, as people when they're 22 often do, of how the world works. Then 1989 happened, and as anyone knows, particularly someone like our dean who was uh, intimately involved in this extraordinary transformation of how the world worked and how it operated, it was uh, a singular time, a singular moment where every assumption we had about how the world worked, what the future would be, was turned on its head. Uh, it's actually why I became a historian, because I, was, was, I had no idea how to make any sense of this. I just finished what I considered a reasonable undergraduate education that had taught me absolutely nothing. What I learned and knew in 1988, like a lot of people, was absolutely useless to understand 1989. So for 20 years, people have been struggling to try to understand the extraordinary events of that year. And I think it's also fair to say that the world we live in today, in ways that many of our students perhaps don't fully recognize, are shaped by those events and the reactions to of those events. And Mary is the first person, lots of people have written about 1989, but Mary is really the first person to look at the consequences, to explain what happened afterwards, and how the events of that momentous year shaped the world we live in today, and will shape the world we live in for years to come. So it is a book, not just of history, but it's a book of extraordinary policy significance, both for today and for the future. And I've got a piece of anecdotal evidence to sort of uh, prove how important it is. Mary was involved in an edited volume that we were just talking about earlier. It involved a lot of the participants. And I was fortunate enough to be an external reviewer on it. And the people involved in those events were absolutely obsessed. <laughs> Bob Zellick, who has a daytime job of being head of the World Bank, contributed a very long essay that's pretty much all about Mary. So, this gives you an idea. This is not just history and understanding what happened in the past. It's understanding its consequences for today and for the, for the future. And the arguments that Mary makes and will make today are very, very important. They're not uncontroversial, uh, and, uh, but they're very, very exciting and important. So it gives me extraordinary pleasure, and it's a great honor to uh, and welcome my good friend Mary Cerati to the LBJ School, the Strauss Center, and the University of Texas. Please join me in welcome. Thank you. 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 You know, Frank, that was such a kind introduction. I'm reminded of a Lyndon Johnson quote from when he received a similarly kind introduction. He said, I wish my parents had been here to hear that. My father would have enjoyed it, and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> no, it's really, the pleasure is really all mine. I've known Frank. I've had the great pleasure to know Frank for even longer than many of the people in this room who have the pleasure to know him now. I've gotten to know Jeremy as well, and so it was really great to be invited down and to have the topic, chance to talk to you about my book, and also about what's followed my book. I was explaining to some of the people I met yesterday, there's that old saying, the king is dead, long live the king. I feel like my book is published long live my book research because so many of the Freedom of Information Act requests that I filed in five countries are now still yielding fruit. So I am still doing work on this topic and what I've been doing is publishing articles since the book came out. So what I'm going to try to do today is give you, for those of you who aren't familiar with the book, uh, give you a summary of its arguments. I'm happy to go into more detail and questions and then talk a little bit about the ways that I've been developing the book since it was published with my new sources, ones I haven't published yet. And then finally, this, this is a public policy school, close with a few speculations on the um, legacy of these events for international relations today. 
and have, hopefully then we'll have time for questions and discussion. So I look forward to that very much. So um, the book is an international history of 1989. It's written from the point of view of a number of countries, but because I figured you didn't really want to hear a four and a half hour talk, I figured I would concentrate on U.S. foreign policy today in the talk. Um, as I said, the book deals with a number of countries, but my focus today will be on U.S. foreign policy and what I saw in the sources. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of the um, scholarly literature on uh, the um, end of the Cold War. And then I'll talk a little bit about what I actually saw in my own research about the transnational revolutions from below and the international reaction from above. And finally, I'll conclude with, as I said, some speculations on legacy and policy implications. So uh, the literature when I started uh, working on this book uh, was a literature largely focused on Washington and on the United States. Probably the one that was the standard text was by two participants and colleagues of Bob Hutchings, uh, Philip Zelico and Condoleezza Rice, Germany Unified and Europe Transformed, which is an account of their experiences in the White House working on this issue. And they were also very kind. They footnoted that book. So that's been very useful to me and a number of other scholars because even though those documents were not open, uh, myself and a number of other scholars could file Freedom of Information Act requests in a very targeted way because we had their footnotes to guide us. So that book has been very useful. Um, so they argued that at the end of the Cold War, uh, United States foreign policy was dominated by skill, speed, and regard for the dignity of the Soviet Union. And as I started to do my research, I originally thought in some ways I would be doing the foreign language sources research to match theirs because they did such a great job on Washington. So I was going to use my language skills and go to European countries and do research. And I actually started with the assumption that this, this was correct. But as I started to do my research, I came to the conclusion that it was definitely done with skill and definitely done with sk speed. But regard for the dignity of the Soviet Union, that was not a view shared in other capitals. So uh, I came in the course of my research, even though this was my starting premise, to question it. And that's always very, a very interesting moment for a scholar when your sources kind of smack you in the face and say, hey, your assumptions are not actually working here. And then more recently, uh, I was Dan Dudney and John Eikenberry, now these are political scientists, published an article in Survival January 2010 saying that the diplomatic conversation at the end of the Cold War concerned architectures that would integrate the Soviets and Russians into pan-European and pan-Atlantic institutions. And that emphasis is in the original. I haven't added it. Now, this is 2010, so this is now a number of years later. I've now finished my research and just published my book. And I looked at that article in 2010, and I thought, that's very interesting because that's the exact opposite of what I argue in my book. That's the opposite of what I found in my five years of research in foreign sources. I wonder who they're citing. And when I flipped to the footnote, I was amazed to discover that they footnoted my book. <laughs> Which is proof that you can publish all you want, but if people don't read it. <laughs> I, so it was a real, a real shock. And the article actually continued on to say that the result of the end of the Cold War was a new architecture of international institutions and cooperation, which is exactly the opposite of what I argued in my book. And then more recently, John Eikenberry, in his liberal Leviathan volume that just came out earlier this year, said that if the end of the Cold War was itself a surprise to many observers, so too was what followed, the remarkable stability and continuity of cooperation within the American-led order. Uh, that did, uh, the end of the Cold War was definitely a surprise, but th the stability and continuity of cooperation within the American-led order was not, in my opinion, a surprise. It was a policy goal, and that policy was successfully achieved. So in other words, as I started to work in these non-English language sources, the picture that the people who are writing based on English language sources, the picture that they were offering, started to me to look questionable. So what is it that I saw in these foreign language sources? Well, that requires me to summarize a little bit of uh, history, transnational revolutions from below and international reaction from above. So of course, we're familiar with the history of the late 1980s, with the uh, uh, popular movements that swept across Eastern Europe. Of course, you have the extremely significant solidarity movement in Poland. You have, uh, after Mikhail Gorbachev comes to power in the Soviet Union and announces that he's going to allow freedom of speech, he's going to allow complaints, 
Uh, he, held so, he held semi-free elections in the Soviet Union. Of course, the countries of the Warsaw Pact uh, take that and run with it. Uh, Poland has uh, also semi-free elections, and Solidarity wins 99 of the 100 seats that it's allowed to contest. And this, of course, inspires a groundswell of popular protest across Eastern Europe. Uh, for those of you who are younger, obviously we're seeing it now in the Arab Spring. Uh, for those of you who are older, you, of course, remember these dramatic days being glued to the television set, watching what was happening in Europe. So, uh, of course, you see here Solidarity protests. This is a picture of a protest movement in Leipzig. Uh, Leipzig is a town in uh, East Germany. There was a, uh, there had always been a church, an active church-based protest movement there, uh, based in the Protestant Nikolai Kirche, uh, Nikolai Church, and this group would have peace prayers on Monday nights, and sometimes in the 80s these were attended by as few as six people. Uh, but these peace protesters would not be deterred, and they would gradually start it after Gorbachev came to power. Instead of going home, just going home quietly from the peace prayers, they started to actually walk through the streets calling for peace, calling for freedom, calling for elections, and gradually it snowballed. So every Monday it went up kind of an order of magnitude, 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people. And so you started to have these regular giant Monday night peace protests. Uh, and the East German regime, it's now clear from the evidence available, thought very seriously. This is one of the new pieces of things I've been working on. The East German regime was in very close contact with Beijing about trying to figure out how Beijing carried out Tiananmen Square because it was very interested in doing something similar in Leipzig. Uh, so uh, fortunately, um, the pressure of the Soviet Union, was, it was possible to oust the really hardline East German leader before that happened, but it was still a very hardline regime. And then, of course, you have the opening of the Berlin Wall on November 9, 1989, which is one of the best single examples of contingency in history ever, because the East German regime did not intend to open the Berlin Wall. The hardline East German regime, having uh, gotten rid of its hardline leader, thought that was probably enough to satisfy the crowd. They put a younger guy in charge. It didn't actually intend to open the wall. As a kind of sop to public opinion, because they felt like they had to do something, the Politburo decided to start holding press conferences. This was an unbelievably bad idea because, of course, <laughs> there was no incentive for any of the Politburo members to have developed any media skills whatsoever. <laughs> so the Politburo, as a sob to popular opinion, decided to make a minor change to how you would apply for a visa to travel. But the spokesman, the Politburo member who announced it, botched the announcement so badly that the world media thought he had said the wall was open. And this was, of course, the result on November 9th, 1989. And so once this happened, suddenly it's an entirely new situation. This was not intentional, but when it happened on November 9th, 1989, it was suddenly apparent to everyone that the Cold War order was over. I mean, it had been clear that it was crumbling, but once this happened, it was clear that the Cold War order was over. And of course, I'm very jealous of Bob Hutchings, who was actually had the great fortune to be on the National Security Council staff, which I can only imagine how exciting it must have been to be following these events. So, and he was, I should say, a huge help to me and gave me a large number of documents for this research, so I'm very grateful to you for this help. So, once this happened, this, this is, this is a, a, a clear moment of break, a clear breakage. In other words, um, this is what uh, John Eikenberry has referred to as a, an ordering moment, a time when the political order is starting to shift or be up for grabs. The social theorist William Sewell has referred to it as a moment of accelerated change. Perhaps my favorite theoretical understanding of this kind of moment actually comes from the evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould. Stephen Jay Gould uh, used to say, when I, Stephen Jay Gould, look at the historical record par excellence, which is the fossil record, I do not see a little bit of evolution on Monday and a little bit of evolution on Tuesday and a little bit of evolution on Wednesday. In other words, I don't see gradualism. He said, what I see is events like an asteroid slamming into the Earth, <coughs> completely changing, throwing up a cloud that changes the Earth's atmosphere, kills off all the dinosaurs, uh, gives a chance to those small mammalian creatures, uh, who take advantage of this punctuation, that's what he called it, uh, take advantage of this punctuation and the new situation to adapt and thrive. He said, and then after that, there's a new period of stasis or equilibrium. So he said, what I see when I look at the fossil record is I see these punctuational moments, I see the asteroid hitting, I see all kinds of change, and then a new stasis or a new equilibrium emerges for a long period until another punctuational event happens. 
So in other words, theorists in a whole number of fields have come up with this idea that there is something different about these ordering moments or moments of accelerated change or punctuational moments, whichever theoretical name you want to use for them. There are these moments where it's clear that suddenly many different futures have opened up. And as a historian, that's a great, uh, a great moment to study because, of course, our method involves detailed study of sources. And there's more sources out there than there are days of my life. So I want to be sure that I'm using the days that I have to study sources from these really crucial moments. So what was interesting to me then was that what happened after this event. Even though this is clearly a moment of groundswell from below, the leaders of the protest, it's curious how quickly they disappear. Um, I would be surprised if anybody in the room knows who this is. Does anybody in the room know who this is? Yeah, I would be surprised if anyone said yes. This woman was known at the time as the mother of the East German Revolution. Her name is Berbel Bolai. Although she was a very frail woman, uh, her moral courage knew no limits. Uh, repeated interrogations and abuse by the Stasi refused to uh, cow her. Finally, they didn't know what to do with her. They threw her out of the country. She smuggled herself back in. And uh, she was an utterly fearless campaigner for uh, basically personal liberty and for freedom. Uh, and she was, as I said, known at the time as one of the, as the mother of the revolution. But uh, she and a whole bunch of people like her were not the people who constructed political order. In other words, the question that interested me is when you have the complete collapse of the, the pre-existing political order, who gets to construct the order afterwards, the new order, or restore the old order? But who gets to recreate order? And this was a classic case of the revolution eating its children. She was actually horrified by what followed the wall coming down. She was horrified by the fact that it didn't include creation of, for example, kind of pan-European institutions that could have prevented the violence in the Balkans, which she blamed on the Western powers. And she spent much of the rest of her life volunteering in the Balkans to try to help refugees from the crises there. Rather, after the Berlin Wall comes down, the, it's the, so after this transnational wave of protests from below, it's the international heavyweights from above who move in, the political pros, who move in and construct political order from above. And they do so uh, because, first of all, they know how to do it. They have the, the knowledge and the skill set to do it. And they also have popular legitimacy. When these issues are actually put to a vote, uh, voters vote overwhelmingly for the established Western politicians they know rather than the visions of the revolutionary leaders who they've been willing to follow in revolution but are not willing to follow after that ordering moment. So, at this, so what began to interest me, once I realized that some of my assumptions were not working, I began to realize, wait a minute, I, I see all this change at the ground level. The walls come down, East Berliners embracing each other, Eastern Europe, the, the, the Iron Curtain coming down. A lot of change at the city level, state level, country level. But at the elite, rarefied level of international relations, actually, not that much changes in institutional terms, from the Cold War period to the post-Cold War period. And that was what started to interest me, which is why am I seeing this disconnect between all of these changes, as I said, at the city, state level, but not at the level of international relations. In other words, here you have, this was a map of my childhood, a map of Cold War Europe. And you can, of course, clearly see that it has a front line going through it. Now, this map is a a Warsaw Pact NATO map, non-aligned. I know it might be hard to read in the back. But basically, the darker green color are NATO countries, and the orange color are Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact countries. And you can clearly see that there is a front line in Europe, and it runs through the middle of Germany. Uh, and I realized when I look at today's map of Europe that there's still a front line. It's further east, but there's still a clear dividing line. Now, this map is, of course, EU, non-EU, but I could also put a map up there of NATO, non-NATO, and it would have the same effect. And I began to wonder, for what reason is that still there, despite all of these changes that happened at the ground level? And uh, fortunately, uh, this question, I was able to work on this question as a historian, because um, for three reasons, I actually had access to sources. Usually, if I were giving this talk, those of you in the audience who our historians might be saying, wait, wait, time out. You're a historian. You need to work from primary sources. How could you have worked on a topic so recently with high quality primary sources? And the answer is uh, there's actually three reasons. The first reason is that many of the sources I used are, are items that were never classified. 
So the materials I use to look at the transnational revolution from below, to look at the protest movement, there's fantastic protest movement archives. There's one in East Berlin, there's one in Warsaw, the Solidarity Archive. There's a fantastic archive in, in Moscow called Memorial, which isn't even an archive because they're still fighting Putin's limits on freedom of speech. Uh, those places have things like the copies of the peace prayers, diaries of protesters, copies of the protesters they used. They're, it's a phenomenal collection of archives. It's really, it's really moving to work there. So those sources were never closed, uh, and those, are, uh, those were wonderful sources. Another, the second reason was that as a contemporary historian, I rely heavily on sound and video. In other words, what was really most important the night of November 9th was the television broadcast. So uh, those sources have also not been closed. What's hard there is talking your way into a television station's archive. They really couldn't figure out what, which one of their competitors I was working for. <laughs> and I kept trying to say, they kept saying, who's paying you? And I kept trying to say, no, I'm not being paid. I'm just interested. And they're like, no, 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 you're lying. Who are you paying you? <laughs> they sort of couldn't believe that I just wanted to go see footage from 1989. And then, of course, there's problems because it's video and they don't sell videotape. So it's hard to work with a video source, which is ir ironic because, of course, on the night, television was all anybody was watching. And then the third reason that I was able to look at sources was that uh, the political actors involved have very strong feelings about these events. Uh, for some of them, it was the highlight of their political lives. For others, it was the beginning of the end. But they had very strong feelings about this. And so in the West, uh, in particular, Helmut Kohl uh, decided that uh, in 1998, when facing an election that he eventually lost, he had been chancellor for 16 years, and he was facing his first real challenge in 1998, he decided in response to that to ignore all of German archival law, thus infuriate, infuriating a generation of archivists who still loathe him to this day, and released and published his records, that's the equivalent of the White House, from the summer of 1989 to the end of 1990. And it's an unbelievable collection. He released and published them. And it's almost as if he told someone, go down to the basement, put your hand in the folders at May 1989, put your other hand in the folders at about October 1990, pull it out, type it, publish it, because it is not edited. It includes, for example, foreign correspondence in the original language, including from Washington, uh, of documents that are still classified here. Uh, and it was not cleared with any foreign, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't cleared. Right, exactly, yeah. So when I came across this collection of documents, which I ordered on Amazon.com, OK? <laughs> I mean, I, and I, I really, I, I, was, I picked it up from the post office, and I nearly got run over as I was walking across the street reading it because I couldn't believe it was hiding in plain sight. So it was an incredible collection of documents, and I read through it. And then what happened is in response to Helmut Kohl doing that, Mikhail Gorbachev, because he felt that he was the loser, he did the same thing. He released and published hundreds of his, hundreds, hundreds of his documents. Uh, so then once I read the German documents and I read the Russian documents, I realized that that gave me leverage. <laughs> so then when I contacted the office of Sec former Secretary of State James Baker, I could say, Secretary Baker, I've read the German and the Russian versions of your visits there. I'm a scholar. I'm trying to do a serious book. I would very much like to tell your side of the story, too. Could I please have your records for these visits? Secretary Baker said, Yes, instead of no. <laughs> and so then it snowballed. So then I went to the people who had the keys to the um, Francois Mitterrand papers and said, you know, I'd really like to see Francois Mitterrand's contributions. They seem to me to be more important than previously appreciated. And so after a lot of very godlike, like, oh, no, 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 eventually they said, we, we, we. So then I read the Mitterrand papers. <laughs> and I mean, so it kept snowballing. So then I went to the Thatcher people. I mean, it was, it was, I can't tell you, it was so much fun. I really miss this process because it, you know, got this momentum going, and I was sort of unstoppable. So it was a lot of fun. And then, of course, there were, as I said, very kind individuals like Bob Hutchings, who gave me private papers as well. So in the end, it took me about five years. But in the end, I, these are all the places that I managed to do research personally, uh, either archival material or sound and video recordings, East, West German, East German television. Uh, and then the places that I did not go myself, I had friends who helped me and sent me materials mm -hmm. from all of these areas. So. Uh, then I had the sudden problem, which is that far from having too few sources, I suddenly had too many sources. I had original material from nine different countries, uh, and it was a mountain of material. Um, and I also was able to do interviews, because of course one of the great benefits of contemporary history, as those of you who do it know, of course we have two wonderful practitioners of it here, Jeremy Surrey and Frank Gavin, you can do interviews as well. And so these are some of the people who are kind enough uh, to give me their time. Uh, in the United States, in divided Germany, in European countries, former dissidents, 
uh, it was really uh, a really exciting research process. But I also realized the book had the potential to sprawl out of control at this point because I had so much, so much material. So uh, I decided in writing the book, oh, and then of course, there, right here, sorry, I'm going to go back. Right, right. So I decided when I was writing the book to try to learn from the actors themselves and try to learn from the questions that they were facing themselves. Now, I'm going to go through these, but before I do, what I would like to suggest is try to forget that you know what happened after the fall of 1989. Now, obviously, we all do. But in the summer of 1989, particularly after the horrible Tiananmen Square uh, massacre where the Chinese Liberation Army fired on the people of China, the People's Liberation Army fired on the people of China, you see here this before, of course, the massacre happens. This is the art students at the Chinese Academy of Art have constructed a goddess of democracy who is staring Mao in the face uh, in Tiananmen Square. Uh, that, of course, ended violently. And it is a taboo topic in China to this day. And that was very much on everyone's mind in 1989. So I ask you to try to think about these as if these were open questions. Now, you, obviously, you know the answers to them. But imagine it's the summer of 1989, and you don't know the answer to these questions. So what's going to happen to these old communist regimes? Are they going to expire violently? And you can, of course, think of some parallels here to the Arab Spring as we're talking about this. Are they going to expire in a way that's going to leave bloody scars across Europe? What's going to happen to central planning? The protesters from below, they, they, many of them believed in socialism. They just thought it had been implemented badly. Uh, what would central planning continue? Um, Alan Greenspan has called November 9th, 1989, the day that the wall came down, the most important day in economic history, in economic history, because he felt that that was the day that definitively settled the battle between advocates of a centrally planned economy and advocates of a liberal market economy. Uh, but this, in the summer of 1989, is still a question. What would happen to Germany? Would Germany unify? Would it stay divided? What would happen if it unified? Would it be nationalistic? What would his neighbors do? So this is a huge open question. What would the European community do? Would it intensify its efforts at integration? Would it create a common currency? This idea of common currency was floating around. It had been talked about for decades, but never actually implemented. Uh, are you going to implement this in the near future, the distant future, or never? What, what's it going to mean for the Euro European community if there's that kind of change? What's going to happen to NATO? Is NATO going to say, declare victory and go home if, it's, if the Soviet Union is collapsing? Is it going to stay where it is? Is it going to take on new challenges? What does that mean for the future of the alliance? And what's going to happen to Russia if there's no border in the middle of Europe? Does Russia suddenly become, finally become an integral part of Europe? Does it stay on the periphery? What does the future hold? So these are just a number of the huge questions that are open in the summer of 1989. So in order to get on top of all these sources and all these interviews and all these questions, it took me a while, but I finally realized that the answer was staring me in the face. I should learn from my sources. And in all of the countries that I worked in, regardless of the languages, actors used architectural concepts and terms to describe what was going on. Uh, again and again, I would see references to Gorbachev talking about a common European home, Baker talking about a transatlantic security architecture, Helmut Kohl talking about a Germany under a European roof. The word blueprint comes up all the time. The word construction comes up all the time. And so I realized I should learn from these actors and, and use the same conceptualization that the people at the time were using. And so it suggested to me a conceptualization of the immediate post-Cold War period as an architectural competition between models of political order. In other words, I realized that architects and politicians basically want the same thing. They want permission to fabricate the future. And so basically, that ordering moment when the Berlin Wall comes down was the unexpected starter's gun going off on a competition between models of order for the future, models of political order for post-Cold War Europe. And once I realized this, I realized that there were a lot of different visions for the political order for po the post-Cold War world, in other words, the world that we're in. Some of them were completely crazy. But I realized that there were four models that had some different, that at least had at least some level of support. Mm -hmm. Now, I will go through each of these in detail. Uh, what I did is I continued the architectural metaphor. Restoration is an architectural term, uh, meaning to reproduce something exactly as it was before. Revivalism is a term meaning to adapt it to new uses. Heroism is a, a very grand vision. 
and prefab means something constructed at one location and taken to another. As I said, I will go through all through these more in, in more detail. I just want to add that what I'm trying to do here with these four models is I'm not trying to say all four were equally likely. They were not. The model that won was the most likely. Rather, what I'm trying to do is establish topologies, not probabilistic values. In other words, I'm trying to help us to understand the post-Cold War world that we did get by contrasting it with the alternative futures that we did not. So topologies of political order in order to understand more clearly which one we actually, uh, which one we actually ended up with. And these topologies, this is not a dichotomy. It's not like there's good outcomes and bad outcomes. Rather, these models are on a spectrum, right? Uh, a, a worse outcome, of course, would have been of some kind of Tiananmen Square in Europe. The outcome that we actually got is very far in the direction of the ideal end of the spectrum. But I would argue that it's not actually at the perfect end of the spectrum, that there were a number of open questions and unfinished business left in place by the model that won. So what are these models? Uh, well, the restoration model, as I've mentioned, is a model to restore exactly what had existed before without any alteration. This was a Soviet plan advanced as soon as the wall came down to say, you know what? Let's have the four occupying powers of Germany handle this. Let's restore the quadripartite occupation mechanism of 1945 because, of course, Germany was a divided and occupied country from 1945 until 1994. Uh, and let us, uh, well, the occupation ended legally in 1990, but the troops were there until 1994. So the Soviet response was, let's uh, get the four powers together, first get the four occupying powers together, and then let's have the World War II peace conference. And of course, this is a great historical trivia, trivia point, which is when was the last meeting of the Allied Control Commission for Berlin? It was December 1989. The Soviets got the British, the American, and the French to agree to this. And so in December 1989, the four powers had a meeting in Berlin. And if you read the transcripts, it's really remarkable because the language seems very much like it could be 1945, except it's not. It's 1989. The fact that this meeting took place in December 1989 infuriated Helmut Kohl. There was a lot of agreement between West Germany and the United States, but this was a real moment of dissent, and James Baker ended up apologizing personally to Kohl. Helmut Kohl said, why are the four powers having a meeting without us? We're a NATO member. We're one of the largest exporting nations in the world. Yes, there was consultation in advance, but the four powers cannot have a meeting in Germany and dictate our future to us. And so he realized that he needed to come up with an alternative, because otherwise that void was going to be filled. And so without telling anyone in advance, uh, the only um, foreign leader who got a copy of the speech in advance was George Bush, but it wasn't translated. Helmut Kohl suddenly announced what I'm calling the revivalist model. Now, revivalism in architectural terms means to duplicate an older structure but adapt it for modern usage. And so what Helmut Kohl and his advisors came up with in a rush was the 10-point plan, where he basically said, let's revive the idea of a Germanic confederation. Because for most of its history, Germany was not a nation state. It was an affiliation of places bound by Germanic languages, but broken up in the Holy Roman Empire into dukedoms and fief other fiefdoms. So he said, why don't we maintain uh, the two Germanys? We'll have a confederation just for two Germanys, not like in the past when there were hundreds of little subunits. We'll have a confederation just with two Germanys. There'll be a shared national roof over both of these Germanys. And gradually, if we're really lucky, in maybe 20 years, we could have unification. So maybe by 2010, we'll start talking about unification. So this was the 10-point plan, which was announced uh, to the surprise of the world. Uh, Gorbachev was livid, uh, said this is, started using Nazi language to refer <coughs> to Helmut Kohl, saying this is you know, German nationalism resurgent again. And so Gorbachev and the Soviet Union, uh, they were, of course, stumbling badly at this point with the economic collapse of the Soviet Union. And by this point, some uh, observers estimated that the situation was as bad as it was in wartime. Uh, he, was, he was behind the curve. He was not used to being the one behind events because before that, of course, he'd been the great reformer, and now he's actually losing out. He proposes a very vague plan. It doesn't really become definite, but the idea is to create a, a European security institution from the Atlantic and the Pacific. And this here, I'm citing Eichenberg and Dudney. This actually was a plan to integrate the Russians into pan-European and pan-Atlantic institutions. And he is very, uh, he's very blunt that he wants to do this. In one particular meeting with uh, James Baker in May 1990, he, James Baker says, this is not going to work. And he says, well, why don't we put... Uh, why don't we merge NATO and the Warsaw Pact? 
and James Baker says, that's a fantasy, we're not going to do that. And Mikhail Gorbachev says, well, what about putting the Soviet Union in NATO? And James Baker keeps saying, that's a fantasy, let's talk about reality. And Gorbachev gets very upset, and he says, this is not a fantasy. The United States and the Soviet Union together were allies, defeated Nazi Germany. We were allies before, we can be allies again. And James Baker says, that's a fantasy, we're going to talk about realities. So he has this, this ambitious plan, uh, but it, he can't get any traction with it. He can't make any progress with it. And in the meantime, Vaughn and Washington. Why, why yeah, sure. Fantasy, Actually, could I answer that in the, in the, in the question and answer? Is that okay? So, uh, and also maybe Bob Hutchings could also answer that. Uh, so, uh, the, what ends up happening is that Bonn and Washington, and in this period there is extraordinary cooperation between Bonn and Washington. It's described brilliantly in Bob's book. It's, it's sort of, there's almost more consultation with the West Germans than there are, there are with other departments of the U.S. government. Helmut Kohl at one point is coming over every three weeks for talks with the White House. Bonn and Washington working very closely together decide on a strategy of what I call prefabrication. Now, it's important to say here, by prefab, I in no way mean cheap or insubstantial. Far from it. Actually, in architecture right now, prefab is one of the hottest possible fields because it's very environmentally friendly, it creates a lot less waste. Uh, and so, in architectural terms, the word prefab is a very positive term. And, but it, what it does mean is you take a pre-existing model and you duplicate it and then move it to a new site. And I realized that this worked well because what Bonn and Washington realized is, you know, we already have these Western economic, political, and security institutions that are successful. They appeal to people in the East. So why don't we take the Daymark, the, East German, the Western currency, the European community, the basic law, and NATO, why don't we take those and extend them into the East? Take our successful prefab and extend it into the East. The Grin Gazettes was particularly problematic. The West German, the reason it's called the West German Basic Law and not the West German Constitution is that when it was written, the Germans who were involved in writing it said, we don't want to write a constitution, and we don't want our capital in Frankfurt, because that will make the division of Germany look permanent. We'll have a major capital, we'll have a constitution, we'll be a state. No, 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 no. We're going to put our capital in some old buildings in Bonn, which is a village, and we're only going to write a basic law, and it includes Article 146, which says, when the Germans are united in free self-determination, they will have a constitutional convention, and this document will lose force. Now, in 1945, that seemed appropriate. In 1990, all Germans agree this is the best constitution they've ever had. And the idea that a major eco world economy is going to dissolve its own constitution has sort of unforeseeable consequences. So it's clear to everyone involved that even though it says in the constitution that now there should be a constitutional convention and a new constitution should be written, that that is just practically speaking impossible. So political means need to be found to extend what's supposed to be a temporary document about to lose power into a permanent way into the East. So this is the model that it succeeds. And when the East Germans get their first free vote on this, there are candidates in the East German election of March, March 1990 who are representing all of these views. And this view wins overwhelmingly. And of course, it's Helmut Kohl's party, the CDU, which is representing this view. And so it's clear that there is top level international support for it. It's clear that there is popular legitimacy for it. And so this is the model that then succeeds. And so then Helmut Kohl, of course, stops talking about reunification by 2010. Then, he's, then he says, then he switches, and he, he actually starts doing this sooner, saying, well, okay, let's move this as quickly as possible. East Germany is collapsing so quickly, we really need to implement this as quickly as possible to salvage what's going on there. So uh, it has, this model has more popular legitimacy than other models. Uh, it maintains, it has many advantages. It maintains older institutions, so you don't have the hard work of having a constitutional convention and writing a new constitution, which is hard, and creating new architectures, which are hard. You, you have reliable institutions that you know. But it does leave, there's no spot in it for Russia. The internal discussion on this is really pretty clear. Of course, you know, there's the public rhetoric about a new world order, but internally, Bob Gates, at that time, the Deputy National Security Advisor, of course, recently Deputy Department of Defense, Secretary of Defense, said, we're going to bribe the Soviets out. Basically, we're going to move these prefab structures into Eastern Europe, and we're going to bribe the Soviets out, and the West Germans are going to pay the bribe. So the internal discussion is really very frank. Uh, one of the more impressive things about the Bush administration was its discipline with regard to the media, so there aren't these kinds of leaks that you see with later administrations, but the internal discussion is really pretty frank. 
Um, so I've, this is what I've published in the book and subsequently in my diplomatic history, international security, foreign affairs articles. Um, so if you're interested in the details, you can go see those there. What I'm putting up here are a few quotations that I haven't yet had a chance to publish. As I said, I'm still getting sources in response to these uh, Freedom of Information Act requests that I filed in all these countries. So just a few of my unpublished sources as a presentation to you guys. The East Germans, after those elections, the East Germans briefly had a freely elected government. And uh, it briefly they had a foreign minister who was in fact one of the protesters, a man named Marcus Meckel. Now Marcus Meckel was a pacifist at a time and in a place where being a pacifist meant having your future canceled. Marcus Meckel uh, refused to do the mandatory military service in East Germany and was denied permission to go to university, was assigned a job as a janitor. This is fairly common in a centrally planned economy, giving housing hours away from where he had his job as a janitor. This happened to a number of the protesters. And so the one avenue open to him, the one avenue that was somewhat free, were the churches. So he ended up going into the churches. Uh, other protesters went through the same route after they saw their friends killed. Many of them were committed pacifists and felt that the only outcome suitable for the end of the Cold War was to demilitarize Central Europe. In particular, they were friendly with the Polish protesters. They were friendly with the Czech protesters. They had a very idealistic vision of dissolving the borders in Central Europe and creating a neutral demilitarized zone between East and West. And he was briefly the foreign minister of East Germany until the CDU prime minister, uh, Lothar de Maizière, forced him out. So briefly, while he was in office, his analysts said the US and the West Germans are going to exploit Soviet weakness to the hilt. Uh, be, the U.S. fears, above all, the loss of its dominant position in Europe. The West German analysis was somewhat similar. Continuance of the U.S. role, this is in 1990, is in question. French analysis. The United States is obsessed with the idea that a unified Germany should become a full member of the Atlantic Alliance. Francois Mitterrand was sympathetic to Gorbachev's idea that there should be pan-European institutions and was floating this notion of a Europe of confederations. But he could never get any traction for that either. Uh, and then, of course, there's um, the Bush Library here has been fantastic about releasing sources. Uh, the, um, here you see former President George H.W. Bush and Secretary of State James Baker. Uh, here's some of the material that I have from there. Baker, NATO is the raison d'etre for keeping U.S. forces in Europe. Bush, the Soviets are not in a position to dictate Germany's relationship with NATO. To hell with that. We prevailed and they didn't. Um, the sharp-eyed among you will know that this was actually published in Bush's memoirs, but I have now found it in the original sources, and it and the other quotations in the memoir are verbatim. So that is a really, really useful memoir. Uh, so this is the tenor of the internal discussion when it's just Bush and Baker at Camp David. Baker, the real risk to NATO is CSCE. The real risk to NATO is CSCE. Now what does that mean? CSCE is the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. It's an organization that includes, does include the Soviet Union, does include all the European countries. It was largely, I think it's fair to say, a talking shop uh, intended to foster dialogue, to, to uh, try to venue where important people can meet, try to dampen down escalation. But the concern, what lays behind this comment, is the concern that what if the Europeans really beef it up? What if that becomes the main security organization in Europe? What if it hands America its hat? In other words, the concern now isn't the Soviet Union, which is clearly collapsing. Now we're trying to think long term. What if there's a fortress Europe that expels the United States? Is CSCE going to be the core of it? Bush, CSCE cannot replace NATO. If that happens, we will have a real problem. So in other words, there's, th there's longer term strategic thinking. And fair enough, they're running the country. They should be doing longer term strategic thinking about the US position in Europe. And the real danger they're seeing is that this is a moment uh, when uh, U.S. presence in Europe could possibly dimi be diminished, and they actively work to perpetuate U.S. preeminence in Europe, which is the title of my international security article. So uh, they don't want their Eastern Europe to have some kind of neutral or bridge function. They share this with Helmut Kohl, who agrees with them very strongly. They don't want a fortress Europe. That ex actually phrase actually comes from Helmut Kohl. Uh, they don't want changes to what has been successful. And this is not surprising. The United States has been very successful in the Cold War. NATO has been very successful. Transatlantic cooperation with Western Europe has been very successful. Why change? So uh, they acting together in just a, a masterful piece of diplomacy are basically able to uh, do what Bob Gates said, to bribe the Soviets out. So even though in public, Mikhail Gorbachev has this huge public standing, 
He's not only Time Magazine's Man of the Year, he's Time Magazine's Man of the Decade. So even though he has this enormous international standing, they realize accurately, and this is done with skill and speed, that he is tottering at home. He is being under overwhelmed by the economic crisis. He's being overwhelmed by the rise of nationalism. He has a very serious challenge in the form of Boris Yeltsin. The Bush and Cole diplomatic teams, you see them here at the Malta summit, the C6 summit. Were you there in Malta? In Malta, where it was, it was the, uh, 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 the worst storm of the century and everyone got seasick, apparently except for Bush, who has great sea legs and never gets seasick. Uh, they realized that they could outmaneuver Gorbachev. And in fact, the internal discussion makes clear that they realize that he's not going to last long. Uh, this is 1990, and the coup, of course, happens in 1991. In the internal discussion, they're very clear. Cole says, you know, we need to get our harvest in before the storm. We don't know when the storm is coming to Moscow, but it's coming. And it's clear that this is the best possible Soviet leader from the Western point of view. There will never be another Soviet leader as accommodating to the West as Gorbachev. So when the coup that they know is coming happens, they're afraid hardliners are going to replace him. So they realize they need to press him and press him hard and move with skill and with speed. So uh, they are, of course, right. Here you see Boris Yeltsin during the coup that uh, eradicates Gorbachev's authority in the summer of 1991. He hangs on until December 1991, but he's basically, um, he basically is uh, no longer in power. So just to sum up this section, don't worry, I will actually stop talking at some point. <laughs> uh, causation. So Washington and Bonn use realpolitik, uh, not, uh, not the sort of more altruistic versions that are advanced in public, to dominate negotiation process to convince Gorbachev to surrender his position in divided Europe. Uh, the West Germans end up writing very, very large checks. And in exchange, Gorbachev agrees. This takes place in July in a meeting between the Germans and the Russians. He agrees to uh, pull out and let United Germany be part of NATO. Uh, Germany unifies the results of 1989-1990. Europe negates the violent example. So this is a real success. There is no Tiananmen Square in Europe. Uh, the Cold War institutions of Western Europe are extended into the post-Cold War world. The European community and NATO, which had already expanded prior to this, continue to expand to the east, so the prefab strategy. And the Soviet Union, later Russia, remains on the periphery of Europe. So these are the results of 1989 to 1990. So what you see, and it's understandable why this happens, uh, is that you see the perpetuation of Cold War institutions, such as NATO, beyond the end of the conflict for which they were designed. So this is the problem with all prefab. When you take a prefab structure and put it at a new site, you then have problems of, is it appropriate for the new site? And uh, you, so this is a lot of the challenges then facing NATO in the 20, late 20th and 21st century faced the fact that it was a Cold War institution now having to adapt for new challenges. And you also do not see the creation of new institutions. Now, you can say these are crazy, but you, you can say they wouldn't have worked, but you have to admit they would have been new. So you don't see a European security structure from the Atlantic to the Pacific based either on the CSCE, as Bush and Baker feared, or based on the ECEU, as Mitterrand hoped. So you don't see a European Europe, to renew a Charles de Gaulle phrase, uh, which was much in vogue uh, in these days. You don't see Germany put into both NATO and the Warsaw Pact simultaneously. That was one of the developments that Gorbachev had suggested. It seemed crazy at the time, but then within a few years, the members of the Warsaw Pact were in NATO. But you didn't see it play out in, in 89-90. Central and Eastern Europe do not become a neutral bridge zone. The dissidents who wanted to demilitarize Central Europe, not only to honor the end of the Cold War, but also to honor the horrors of the Second World War and the Holocaust, who felt that what should happen is Central and Eastern Europe should never again have military force, they don't succeed. These would have been new. Now, as I said, you can say they would have been crazy, but they would have been new. So. What are some, just to start, just to wrap up, what are some of the uh, legacy and policy implications of what I've talked about? Well, um, one of the, as I said, I didn't start off, when I was researching, I didn't start off with these ideas. These are the, what I found in the evidence. And one of the people who pointed me to it was when I interviewed Douglas Hurd, the former British foreign minister. And uh, this, is record, I, this interview was recorded, and I donated it to Princeton, to the archives, so you can hear it for yourself. So, uh, when I interviewed him, this was fairly early on, he said, you know, I, Douglas Hurd, and he said, I'm talking about myself too, because I was involved. He said, I see 1989, 1990 as a missed opportunity. And this really surprised me as the interviewer, because I didn't expect to be hearing this. He said, there was a chance then when America was at the height of its powers. And he said, you know, if, if we had been as smart as, as Churchill and as Roosevelt, we would have said, you know, 
the whole game is coming into our hands. Let's, let's, let's take on international order. Let's make the UN work. Let's, let's take advantage of America being at the height of its powers. We have a chance which won't come again, which Obama does not have to remake the world because America was absolutely at the pinnacle of its influence and its success. And as I said, I was really surprised when Douglas Hurd said this. Uh, and as I started to research it, I began to see what he meant. Um, now, of course, you have the advantage of hindsight. Uh, and I look back actually to something Stephen Walt had written in Diplomatic History. U.S. leaders saw the Soviet collapse as a golden opportunity to shape the world to their liking despite the selfless rhetoric of the world order. And so this is where I have to move from the realm of my historical work where I can talk to you with certainty on the basis of years of work, where you sort of move into the realm of speculation and think, all right, if we, if we kind of set aside a triumphalist assumption that what happened was the best possible outcome, and we think about what are the unsolved problems? Were there other ways to deal with Russia? Are there other, um, were there other outcomes to world order that might now, in the un uneasy year of 2011, put us in a better position? Um, and you see the, the, for example, you see here that in the 9-11 Commission report in 2004, when the 9-11 report criticized the various branches of government for failing to respond to 9-11 and the challenges of asymmetric warfare, the 9-11 report said the national security institutions of the U.S. government are still the institutions constructed to win the Cold War. That was a criticism. But that, was, that result, institutions perpetuated from the Cold War, was the outcome of the understandable outcome of U.S. foreign policy at the end of 1989-1990. Again, it, was, it had popular legitimacy, it was understandable, but then you have to understand, once you have that prefab decision, what the legacy is. You have prefab from a previous era. So there are even more, here's where it gets really speculative. So if we understand what our post-Cold War order is and what it isn't, um, what does it uh, enable us to predict or say about the Arab Spring, the Eurozone crisis, U.S. relations with China? These are some of the things I've been working on more recently. And this is where my thinking is still very much developing, so I'll look forward to questions on this. But um, for the Arab Spring, uh, New Republic asked me to do this piece, is it 1989 all over again? And I had to say, well, maybe from the sort of ground up level, but from the top down level, the lessons of 1989 are not going to be that relevant. It's not clear what the prefab is, and it's really not clear that there's a desire on the Arab street to copy American models. So I'm not actually sure how relevant 1989 is to the Arab Spring, even though you see that comparison in the media a lot of the time. There's also consequences for the Eurozone. Um, because obviously I'm already talking at great length, I haven't gone into things like French policy. But the one piece that isn't prefab, the one piece that is truly new, is the euro, is the common currency. And that actually is the result of what is basically a deal between Francois Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl, where uh, Kohl will uh, get support from, the Fran from France for German unification, and Kohl in exchange supports the common currency. In the second half of 1989, Mitterrand was not only president of France, France held the rotating presidency of the European community. The 1989, the, the revolution we were all supposed to be talking about in 1989 was the French Revolution. It was the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution in 1989. And the EC presidency, presidency schedule had been carefully managed so that France would be president of the EC in the second half of 1989. They have this glorious summit at the end of the year which would celebrate what the French Revolution gave the world. And of course, that had all been hijacked by a real revolution happening that year. <laughs> and so Francois Mitterrand made it very clear to Helmut Kohl that if Helmut Kohl wanted at the end of 1989, France and the European community to support unification that he needed some, something from Helmut Kohl and in return. And so at the end of the EC presidency in 1989, it was announced both that the EC would support German unification and that finally implementation of the common currency would begin. Now the problem is that neither Kohl nor Mitterrand had any interest whatsoever in economics. They didn't set anything up like an exit strategy or a crisis mechanism or anything. This was all done very quickly. And so a lot of what's going on now in the Eurozone crisis is a historical legacy. So that was what I wrote up for foreign affairs. And then finally, um, there are also what I'm working on right now, and this really is what I'm sending off to journals right now, are the connections to Tiananmen Square. Uh, Deng Xiaoping and the Chinese leadership, as I said, were in fairly close contact with Warsaw Pact regimes, particularly the ones who were also horrified by Gorbachev. And they were trying to figure out a way for hardliners to survive. And Deng Xiaoping, the leader of China, of course, decided to do a military crackdown. We see here the results of it, this famous photo of the tank man. This is June 5th, 1989, in China. And uh, the, um, 
evidence from the Beijing Spring shows a U.S. interest in defense of the status quo in Asia. In other words, there's a real pressure to maintain good relations with the Chinese Communist Party despite the events that had taken place. And the Chinese Communist Party was aware of this. The internal assessment, which they were sharing with their Warsaw Pact allies, is that there will be no real American countermeasures to Tiananmen Square. So this is internal to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, of course, you cannot access this in China, but because they're in correspondence with the Warsaw Pact regimes, you can start to reconstruct Chinese Politburo thinking from these papers as well. And that's the work that I'm actually doing right now as I've been working on Tiananmen Square. So uh, Xi Jinping, the next leader of the Chinese Communist Party, has actually made Tiananmen Square a current topic again. He recently went and visited a very public visit to the widow of Hu Yaobang. Hu Yaobang's death was the event that touched off the Tiananmen Square crisis. And so the future leader of China went and visited the widow of Hu Yaobang. And it's not clear why, but that man is the martyr. He went and visited the widow of the martyr of Tiananmen Square. And he's going to be in charge of the most populous country on earth next year. So I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'm working on it because it seems like it might be important. So <laughs> I'm finally stopping. <laughs> You've probably all lost the will to live by now. But I hope that I have given you a sense of my book as it was published and then of the research that I've been doing since. And I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mary. A uh, tremendous presentation. I forgot. I promised to wave the book. <laughs> <laughs> the book has just come out. In paperback. In paperback. Uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's surprising there's as much room for as many blurbs, <laughs> as favorable blurbs, uh, before. So I'm sure there's a, a ton of questions, and we'll take them in a second. I have a real quick question mm -hmm. I want to ask you. And Jeremy had a question that I need to get back yes, to. Well, yeah, I'm okay. Sure there's a bunch yep. of people with questions here. Uh, one of your critiques seems to be that uh, or what I could have trouble telling from the book in the presentation is your critique of U.S. policy that it chose realpolitik or that it dressed it up as more uh, a more idealistic um, uh, 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 kind of packaging. In other words, that you know Henry Kissinger in Diplomacy once said that his biggest mistake was not understanding that any foreign policy made in the United States has to have the cover of Wilsonianism, even if it isn't. And of course, you know, when we think of FDR, we think the Atlantic Charter on one hand, we think of realism on the other hand. We think of lots of examples. Is your critique the actual policy of realpolitik or the fact that they just portrayed it as something else, that it wasn't? Uh -huh. Or is it a bit of both? Uh, I would say neither, actually. Um, I think portraying, I mean, obviously governments need to operate in secrecy. So portraying a policy as one thing while doing another, I think, is, is standard operating procedure. So I, I don't criticize that. I think it was skillfully done. Um, I think, though, that um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think that now that we have a access to the sources, uh, it's no longer acceptable to rely on public statements just from Washington about what was happening. So now we need to be able to look behind and see the realpolitik that was really going on. And so the, um, the realpolitik, or as I'm calling it, the prefab solution, uh, was um, the quickest response in a situation that demanded speed. And it had popular legitimacy. But what we need to understand is it then has certain consequences. Right? It wasn't the worst outcome. Right? It's not, you know, there was no Tiananmen Square in Europe. I mean, if you drew a line, I guess, can I draw on the board here? Sure. Um, have I got something to draw with? Um, oh, OK. Um, hey, I didn't know that. I would have talked for even longer if I could have been drawing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, if you draw a line from you know, worst case scenario where you have Tiananmen Square in Europe, right? Um, I think the general assessment in Washington has generally been what we got was the best possible outcome, right? That's been the assessment of U.S. foreign policy, right? And then I, I basically come out and say, I think we got a very good outcome, but I think that we stranded, I think we stranded Russia. I think that there was a real opening, and this is where it gets speculative, right? So there's, there's a certain amount of my argument where if you ask me how was U.S. foreign policy conducted, I can give you five years of documents and say this is how it happened. Then it gets speculative, which is, well, what could we have done? And I, my critique is, and this I think reasonable people can differ on, I think that we stranded Russia, that we missed an opportunity. I think that when you go back to the, um, the United States did the same thing three times in the 20th century. Three times in the 20th century, it structured political order in Europe. And the first time was clearly a disaster on a lot of levels, both Wilson and isolationism. So when the second moment happened, the 1945 to 1949 crowd was very conscious of the previous, uh, the previous punctuational moment. They were trying to learn from it and not duplicate its errors. 
its errors. And what surprised me is in 8990, what was really successful in 4549 was the, was the integration of former enemies into cooperative structures, particularly the West Germans, the Japanese, right? And there's no real attempt to integrate this former enemy in 8990. You have bribed the Soviets out instead. Now it's quick, it works, it's successful, but when you bribe the Soviets out, you have to then understand the legacy, right? And then you also have problems like in the 9-11 report where you have outdated institutions. Again, I understand why it happened. I think it was a, you know, far in the positive direction, but I don't think it, the outcome was ideal. And so, but there, so there's this gap in there of all these open issues hanging over from the Cold War, and a lot of them are really big problems in the world now. And so that's my critique. Does that make sense? No, that's great. Okay. Mary, yeah. Well, see this, is, yeah, see, this is where it gets hard, because this is where it gets speculative. So basically what you do is, and this gets to your question a little bit, you go back to some of the models that were being discussed then. So you actually had Gorbachev at the time saying, um, saying, why don't we put a united Germany into both NATO and the Warsaw Pact simultaneously. And the response, this was, Baker made it clear, it was mostly Baker going over, because uh, he's the president's long-term friend, tennis buddy. It's clear to everyone involved that Baker speaks for Bush, right? Um, that Baker and Brent Scowcroft both speak for Bush. So they practically are meeting with world leaders as peers because they have, you know, that's a very important in diplomacy that the emissaries, as you all know, the emissaries have the trust of the president. It's clear to everyone involved that Baker does. So Baker is speaking directly to Gorbachev, and it's clear that um, the U.S. preference is for what I'm calling prefab, right? And so that is going to be the policy, and these uh, visions, these heroic visions that Gorbachev has are not policy. So Baker has his instructions. He's there in Moscow. And uh, the goal is to have a united Germany and NATO. The goal is not to create a pan-European security institution, including Russia. And it's a, you know, it's a well-disciplined administration. It has a debate. It decides on a policy goal. People execute it. They don't leak. I mean, it's an admirable operation, right? Uh, but it doesn't fit with Gorbachev's vision. I mean, when I say heroism, I should, I should have mentioned this earlier, heroism in architectural terms is a different word than heroism in popular usage. Heroism in architectural terms is a very ambivalent word. Uh, it implies to designs like a skyscraper that is awesome but foolhardy and will destroy the neighborhood at its base to be constructed, right? It, it's a term that's used uh, mostly to describe misguided, de misguided design exercises from the middle of the last century, often in the service of authoritarian regimes. It's a term architects don't use anymore. It has bad connotations, right? So Gorbachev has this heroic vision. We're going to have this pan-European, this common European home with all these, you know, everybody. And he doesn't, he isn't really reading the tea leaves right. Gorbachev turns out, he's, I, I think, a great figure in history, but a poor negotiator. And he gets outmaneuvered. And so Baker has his instructions. Baker's instructions are get Germany and NATO. And also, by the way, keep the door open. That also is discussed. That was another surprise for me, that this is discussed at this time period. Um, Keep the door open, and Baker is an excellent negotiator. I would be terrified to negotiate with Baker. So he basically doesn't really let that topic come up. So is that, was that your question? Well, well, it is, but this yeah. almost implies yeah. that. I mean, I guess what, what I'm having trouble understanding yeah. is sort of what would, I mean, it's a great presentation, I'm just trying to critique, but I, I'm just having trouble understanding what this alternative architecture would have looked like. I mean, if it's a heroic yeah. architecture that's unbuildable, right, if it's going to be right. a Frank Lloyd Wright house that leaks through the ceiling and all this right. stuff, right. Why, why would we build it, right? Right, no, I don't think, I don't think Gorbachev's, I don't think Gorbachev's big heroic vision was that, um, was that uh, possible. But putting Germany in both NATO and the Warsaw Pact, I mean, How it's, well, it's, yeah, but it's not that much, it doesn't take that long until much of the Warsaw Pact is in NATO. I mean, it did work, right? No, but there's no Warsaw Pact. <laughs> yes, but, you know, you, you wonder if, if this, at this there's moment, no again, the, the moments, the punctuational moments our moments, perhaps one of the ways to define a punctuational moment is when change is possible. Nobody thought it was going to be possible to unify Germany in 329 days either. You know, if I'd said to you on November 8th, Germany's going to be unified in 330 days, you would have said you're crazy, right? So perhaps what defines a punctuational moment is it's when change is possible, right? I mean, you know, now is not a punctuational moment, right? 9-11 is another punctuational moment. Now it's not a punctuational moment. Well, the last thing I'll, I'll just ask them. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree, but yeah. of course, any, everything yeah. isn't possible. No, no. So what, what is what is so what is more likely? What is more likely? So if you again, if you do again, I like to think of things kind of on a spectrum. So really unrealistic is Gorbachev's heroic vision. Less unrealistic is putting Germany and NATO in the Warsaw Pact. Getting to be more realistic, Francois Mitterrand's ideas of a Europe of overlapping confederations. Right? He's like, okay, we've got the EC. Why don't rather than just extending it, 
why don't we actually kind of create this, and we have CSE, which already overlaps. So, uh, and this is something Gorbachev proposes too. Gorbachev says, you know, you have the G7, how about an E7, an Eastern 7? So, Gor so Mitterrand's thinking is, why don't we create, use CSE as an umbrella, and this is why Bush and Baker are saying the real risk is CSE. Use CSE as an umbrella, because it's got both the US and the Soviet Union, and it's got all of Europe in it. So use that as an umbrella, have the EC as a confederation, set up an Eastern confederation, make them gradually overlap more and more over the years. And this is starting to be more workable. You know, I meet around someone with the savvy to pull this off, right? And this is part of why you then have the speed on the part of Bonn and Washington saying, you know, if we don't, nature boards a vacuum, power boards a vacuum, if we don't implement our model quickly, Mitterrand is going to gain some support. So that's, that starts to be more realistic. But of course, this is all speculative because that's all cut off by prefab. So it doesn't develop, right? And then, you know, then I'm stuck as, you know, I can give you all the sources on everything that happened, but I can't give you the sources on what didn't happen, right? But of course, as you know, one of the challenges of history is understanding that the future is not a given, that there are alternative paths forward and trying to understand the alternative paths. Um, did I address your question? Yeah. Can I make a suggestion as someone who was actually there? <laughs> well, Mitch, if you're willing, we'd yeah, love to hear and I have talked about this. You know, in my book, I, my judgment was, was it so different from yours. I think mm -hmm. I give us, the U.S. policy, extremely high marks for ending the Cold War mm -hmm. and lower marks for the post-Cold War order. It was a difficult transitional period. Mm -hmm. I frankly don't think that the happy end point of your continuum mm -hmm. was available. I don't think mm -hmm. Russia could have been fit into such an order. And the efforts we did make to do that, to invite them into the G7, to make it the G8, look at the evidence. Is the G8 a better operation than the G7? I think no. It's weak in the institution. Um, I think a CSCU-led European order was simply uh, uh, a recipe for European insecurity. It wasn't that CSCE was a threat to American mm -hmm. dominance in Europe. Mm -hmm. It was we didn't think it would work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we failed to be more imaginative. We, we collectively in the West feel to be more imaginative about how Russia could have been brought into a cooperative mm -hmm. global order. Mm -hmm. But Gorbachev was way, his scheme was, was simply un, unfeasible and unwise. To a large extent, Russia has excluded itself. And the other observation I would make is that mm -hmm. we focus, I think, for, for reasons of brevity on the, on the big powers. Mm -hmm. But no one was more eager to exclude Russia than the East European. The Poles didn't need the Americans to tell them that the Russians were Problem. And they didn't want to be part of a NATO if Russia was The one who did feel that way it was Vostok Pavel. And mm -hmm. I was with Baker in uh, February, early February 1990, mm -hmm. six weeks after the Velvet Revolution. Right. And you've read probably some of the, the, the transcripts. Um, Pavel was talking about a pan European peace order. He called mm -hmm. it the FIFO. Mm -hmm. um, and he really believed it, that there was this wider European cooperative order in which everyone would just get along. Uh, six, eight months later, when he came on a state visit to Washington, I was also in that meeting, he was urging early membership for Czechoslovakia and NATO. He'd forgotten about the people and <laughs> wanted to be in a security organization that provided some protection against the Soviet Union that was now cracking down in, in the Baltic states. So I think the where we wound up in 1991, 92, mm -hmm. was not ideal, but it was probably the best available Mm -hmm. uh, we're, still, yep. we're still facing the problem of yep. how to bring Russia into a cooperative global order, through what mechanisms and, and so on. Yep. See, I would say that we agree on the heart of the problem, which is failing to, as you just said, I agree with what he just said, failing to think creatively about a way to bring an unusually, indeed uniquely willing Russia into a global order. Um, I, uh, I, I think that that weighs heavier in my analysis than it does in other analyses. And, and that I, I, see, I see that as a really, a really cardinal failure. Uh, the, but on your, on your subordinate point about Central and Eastern Europe, you have to be a little bit careful. Again, you have to remember this distinction between these punctuational moments and, and, and the periods of equilibrium. There are these moments where change happens very, very rapidly. And in a brief window in early 1990, what the Poles are really worried about are the Germans. The Poles are really having a tough time with Helmut Kohl driving rapidly toward unification. Remember I mentioned the basic law. The basic law included this article 146 that said it, the, it should be dissolved, there should be a constitutional convention. In order to get around that, what the West Germans do is they use Article 23, which is a clause that allows Germany to basically add territory to itself. Now imagine how that feels if you're Polish. Okay, 
the Poles are livid about this. They are in constant contact with Washington, with you, saying the Germans can't do this. And the Poles, in their terror that the Germans are going to somehow try to reclaim Polish territory, which half of Col- which some significant minority of Poles voters still see as German, uh, they want a treaty to say this is never going to happen, and they turn to the Soviet Union. And you know the, the CIA analysts can't believe this. They say Joe Stalin is laughing in his grave. The Poles are actually talking about some kind of alliance with the Soviet Union against Germany, right? And then you have Václav Havel, who, as you said, not only was talking about people, but addressed a, a joint session of Congress and called for all military alliances to leave Europe. Now, that was not what they were expecting Václav Havel to say when he showed up. So uh, you have these Central and East Europeans trying to figure out what's going on, and they're considering all kinds of alternatives, including uh, pan-European, including people with the Soviet Union. This is actually being considered. Then what happens, the East Europeans are savvy. Then they realize, oh, wait a minute, we see what's going on here. It's prefab. It's going to be the Cold War redux. It's going to continue. We're just going to have NATO on one side of Europe and Russia on the other. We know how that works. We just want to be on the, the right side of the line this time. So once they figure out, okay, we're not actually going to have people, once they realize, okay, the future is really going to be like the past, let's just make sure we're on the right side of the line, then it switches. Then it's, okay, now NATO membership. That's what the game is, then NATO membership. But there's this, again, this is why these ordering moments are significant, because then the future is set. Now it's equilibrium, right? But there is this interesting flirtation with Moscow in there on the part of not only the East Central and East Europeans, but also the dissidents who share this vision with Gorbachev of this common European home. Why don't we try to get one or two students up here? We've got two students right here. I'll take each in order, and then you can finish. Um, How much longer do we have, actually? We're actually at our oh, are we? two minutes over. Oh, for goodness sake. Whoa, I didn't whoa, realize. Whoa, I'm sorry. Fun. I'm sorry. I'll be briefer. <laughs> want to hear from the students. OK. So in the process of the current populist moment hmm? in America, um, there's Are we having a populist moment? Well, <laughs> the process of the current yeah. American concern about yeah. uh, the extent of the around yeah. the world, it's very interesting that you revisit the question of America's fear about being left out of Europe mm-hmm. and what that means. Mm-hmm. I mean, you saw a lot of negative reaction to the idea that when TARP money was looking like it was going to bail out European banks that owned U.S. mortgages, that's sort of very incongruous in the arc of post-war history in terms of where the financial transfers have gone. Um, and I'm wondering if you, because you've got a lot of color from American policymakers who at that moment in 1999 mm-hmm. were looking into this abyss of America being left out of Europe. And it's very interesting. I don't think that the speculation about what that means, what the consequence of that, is very coherent. You know, you talk about it's about trade stability, or it's about avoiding another war, or it's avoiding mm-hmm. the rise of a counterweight that could challenge U.S. policy in Southwest Asia or other places, um, or it's ideological solidarity, or it's racial, or something else. And mm-hmm. I'm wondering if your interviews or reviewing what those American policymakers who were fearing being kicked out of Europe or losing their dominant position in Europe, mm-hmm. if you could give shape to what that future actually looked like for them, what was that? What was that risk to American prosperity in the long term in, in that scenario? And why don't we add your question? So this was more about, um, so I, I really like this book, but the thing about what was said over here is what was possible at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is more of a theoretical point that yeah. from this history. Uh, after 1945, that was a time when Germany and Japan unconditionally surrendered, mm-hmm. which was permission for the US-led border mm-hmm reorder the domestic institution mm-hmm. of yeah. uh, IE who lost. And so that would have, for to repeat something like that, to really integrate Russia in a durable way, would have required Mikhail Gorbachev at the time mm-hmm. to say, uh, not only do we need your help, but we'll let you basically reorder the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. um, and, and sort of to, to that level. And he was uh, you know, the subject of a possible coup attempt mm-hmm. um, without having said that. So if he had done that, that would have been, I think, even more violent for the Soviet Union. So in terms of basically getting the Eastern Europe in, which is basically all those uh, individual countries, Czechoslovakia, and so on and so forth, mm-hmm. uh, basically did say, yes, reorder our, our institutions, political mm-hmm. and economic. Whereas, would, I mean, in terms of your analysis, do you think that would have been possible for a Soviet leader or a Russian leader, not just to say we need your help, but really reorder all of it? Do you want me to answer this, or do you want to take some more? No, no, uh, probably. Okay, okay. It, so in 15 seconds or less, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so on the um, on America being left out of Europe, I mean, basically you're, you're, you're touching on competing visions, right? And so you have a certain, okay, imagine it's 1990, and the question is, is the Europe going to be better off in the future with 
with uh, institutional involvement of the United States in Europe uh, really firmly rooted or not. And the Europeans are divided on that, right? The French are hoping more for a European Europe. What they mean by that is not a Europe dominated by the United States. And the French vision is one that sees that as a better route forward for prosperity, security, whatever topic you're interested in. Uh, then you have others like Helmut Kohl who feel that, you know, history shows that if Europe is left alone without the United States, it descends into war. And the best route for Europe going forward is to have the United States involved. So you're, you're at one point, actually, it's funny, at one point Bush asked Baker, he says, um, he says, do the French really hate us that much? I mean, do they really want us to leave? This is in, in 1990. And Baker says, no, the French just wish we were mercenaries available for hire when needed, and that we would then go home afterwards. Um, so they, they don't want us to disappear from the face of the earth, but they don't want us to live there permanently. You know, they'd rather be able to hire us when needed. Right? So you, you have these huge competing visions about whether or not it is, I mean, your question goes to this huge question, right, about whether or not you think it's better for the United States to be involved permanently in, in uh, Europe or not. And you can construct, reasonable people can construct arguments for either side of that debate, right, and especially in the kind of terms you're talking about, which is speculative going forward, right. Um, so then on to uh, your question about uh, working with Gorbachev. Um, uh, yes, obviously there are various differences. I mean, one of the things, I was actually talking to Bill Brands about this, one of the things I'm thinking about doing is another book actually is comparing these three times in the 20th century when the U.S. constructs political order in Europe to look at what the similarities and differences are. And of course, you're absolutely right, World War II is a shooting war and Japan and Germany surrendered unconditionally. Granted, there's all these differences. Um, rather, what I'm trying to say is, you know, you would like to hope that, you know, that learning in foreign policy is cumulative, right? And if you, I mean, this has happened. If you poll historians and ask what's the most successful U.S. foreign policy ever, it's usually the Marshall Plan that wins, right? It's usually something from post-World War II. It's something about stretching out a hand to former enemies and that uh, that then paid off in spades, right? Created a huge market. I mean, you all know, know this better than I do. So. Uh, what was interesting to me in 8990 was that there was not interest in duplicating that model, right? And of course there are other issues. I'm not sure it would have required wholesale restructuring of the Soviet Union. Uh, I mean, the, the you know, there's, there were ways to work with leaders. And Gorbachev, by the way, Gorbachev at the time was saying repeatedly, we need your help. He was saying it to Cole. He was saying it to Bush. Bush couldn't believe it when Gorbachev asked him for money. He's like, you're the Soviet Union. You're our enemy. We could never get it through Congress, and we don't want to give you money anyway. And he would say to Cole, you know, I'm glad that you're willing to give him money. I wish he would stop asking for it. Cole, he went to every leader in Europe. Cole, went around, Cole because he wanted unification, was willing to give him money. Cole went to every leader in Europe and said, Gorbachev needs help. So Gorbachev was asking for help. And he, he was hoping, what seems to have motivated him, is he really had a belief that working together with the rich Western economies, that he could bring the Soviet Union you know, into the future and bring it into a state of economic health and cooperation with Europe. That seems to have been genuine. And the fact that that's not really tried, you know, the sort of idea that, you know, I mean, I agree, I, I agree, by the way, with Bob Hutchings, that it might have failed. But my problem is that it wasn't, I don't really see that it was tried. You know, you'd like to think that it might have been possible to try. At the same time, we were I mean, Bush at the time had said the same phrase, we have the will but not the wallet. So, how, so just in this point, how could Bush or any U.S. president at the time know what the economy what it was at the time be able to give money to someone, to a country that had the missile still pointed there? It's, no, it's not just it's not just Bush. This is a, at this point, you know, that he's collaborating with Cole, he's collaborating with Mitterrand. It's, it's these Western, wealthy Western nations I'm talking about. Well, I think what's really so exciting about this project is that it's continuing. Mm -hmm. Where do you meet someone who writes uh, what is the fundamental work on this question and then continues to work on it while they get more documents? And that's what's so exciting about this. Mary, still publishing articles, still doing projects from this. Still doing 1989. Lots, <laughs> lots more to uh, look forward to. But for those who haven't gotten the book, you should really get it. It's, it's incredibly well written, unbelievably informative, uh, just a terrific book. And Mary, I want to thank you for coming down here and giving thank us you a great me. presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you.